Dear ISV members, colleagues from global vaccine community and all of the attendees, I'm Sean Lu from the International Society of Vaccines, ISV. On a behalf of ISV board officers and my fellow co-chairs for ISV Virtual Congress, I would like to welcome everyone to the third and the last Congress of this COVID-19 vaccine series, especially to those who were among several thousand attendees who returned today after joining us from the last two Congresses. When we launched this series on June 22nd, the total global cases for COVID-19 was close to 8.1 million. One month later, at our second Congress, the number jumped to 14 million, and now <coughs> close to 24 million, a stunning 269% increase within two months. Very soon, we are going to see the total deaths reaching 1 million globally. The world vaccine community, including members of ISV, are racing against the pandemic to develop and license final vaccines in a lightning speed. It is our honor to build this open, scientific, and balanced platform to let everyone sharing their progress and the update. Next, I would like to introduce my co-chair, Professor Linda Klevinsky, to introduce the design of today's Congress. Linda, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So on behalf of my fellow co-chairs and the entire board of the International Society of Vaccines, I'd like to also warmly welcome you to this third ISV Virtual Congress on COVID-19 Vaccine Development. So the concept of this virtual meeting stems from the fact that the ISV took the decision to pause our annual face-to-face -face Vaccine Congress, which was due to take place in Quebec City this autumn, and we decided to defer it to September 2021. But in its place, we've initiated a series of monthly virtual meetings over the summer to provide a balanced update of progress in the development of a safe and efficacious vaccine to control the COVID-19 pandemic. A recording of our previous two ISV virtual congresses that were held in June and July are available on our YouTube channel, the International Society for Vaccines, or these recordings can be found by the link on congress.org. So today is the third meeting in the current series. We've invited vaccine developers from biotech, pharma, and also academia, as well as leading immunologists and virologists, and a senior representative from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to share their collective knowledge to the wider global community. We are delighted that over 2,000 delegates have registered for this meeting from across the globe. We appreciate that the time zone differences do make finding an optimal time for these events tricky, but we found that the early morning start on the west coast of the Americas and the nighttime start in Southeast Asia is an acceptable compromise. In any event, a recording will be available if you miss any part of the event. So we've kept the duration of each Congress down to three hours as we appreciate how busy everyone is but we feel that three hours is long enough to give bite-sized chunks of specialist overviews of important developments in the field. So with that in mind, can I remind today's chairs and speakers to please keep to your time allocation so that we can take a few questions at the end of each presentation. And delegates, please can you submit your questions for the presenters via the live session chat box facility. So the meeting has been today organized into three sessions. So we have an opening session where we will hear two talks, the first about monoclonal antibodies in prevention and therapy trials against SARS-CoV-2, and that will be followed uh, by a talk from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on what they are doing to support a COVID-19 vaccine from basic science through all the way through to manufacturing and distribution. A second session is dedicated to updates from the vaccine developers themselves, 
with a focus on different subunit protein vaccine approaches and novel techniques that have been taken forward and are at different stages of clinical trials. And lastly, the final session is intended as a lively panel discussion where specific issues that pose a potential challenge in addressing efficacy for COVID vaccine development are debated by an esteemed panel of world leading experts. So please do stay for this. Now let me hand over to my fellow co-chair, Professor Sean Lee. Thank you. Uh, it's my great introduction to uh, introduce uh, Professor Michael Cohen. Uh, he is the uh, Yargan Bait Eminent Professor of Medicine, Microbiology, Immunology and Epidemiology at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. He served also as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Global Health at the University and the Director of the Institute for Global Health Infectious Disease. Uh, Mike is the leader of the HIV Prevention Tri Network for a long time, and he is also the PI of a newly formed uh, the NIAID COVID Prevention Network. Uh, under his leadership, the network is doing wider range of preventive trials, especially monoclonal antibody-based uh, approaches. So it's our great honor to hear the last uh, most update uh, information from uh, Mike. Professor Cohen, thank thanks. Um, you, can you hear me okay on this connection? Yeah. Okay, because I once in a while I get a message bad connection from you, so you'll have to interrupt me if 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 you lose my signal and I'll try and move. Uh, and as I understand it, you're going to control the slides. So l let me thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> I know that the time is short, so I have an advantage of being able to talk really fast. So let me have the first next slide, please. So the first thing I want to say is uh, for, the, uh, for people, infectious disease specialists and epidemiologists working in prevention and realizing this is a vaccine meeting and the importance of vaccines, we tend to always focus on combination prevention. And, and it's all the same formula. The first thing we can do is behavior change or structural intervention towards behavior change. And for uh, COVID, that has worked very well in many countries, but not in the United States. An alternative and complementary strategy is treatments that are very effective, especially treatment as prevention. And as we talk about today, if we have a chance, uh, it's possible the monoclonal antibodies will abrogate uh, the probability of onward transmission. So if they're used as treatment, that would serve as treatment as prevention. Likewise, antiviral agents could be developed that would be treatment as prevention. But we're going to focus today on monoclonals mostly for prevention. Um, and and where we are in the development of agents for that purpose. So I'll stop by saying combination prevention is really important if you can establish it. Next slide, please. So I want to start with convalescent plasma, which has obviously attracted a lot of news this week. And, and convalescent plasma, it really, you have to believe that it's going to contribute, that it will have uh, neutralizing antibodies or other agents within convalescent plasma to, to kind of see your way towards monoclonal antibodies. This is just a review by Arturo costa Devalo, who's been a leader in these activities. Next slide, please. And a series of small studies have attracted a lot of attention. And, and the unfortunate issue here is sometimes the cart gets in front of the horse. So convalescent plasma came out of the gate as some, um, you know, alternative that required less perhaps critical inter, um, experimentation. And so lots of small underpowered studies were done, most of which seemed to demonstrate a benefit to convalescent plasma, but um, none of them were large randomized controlled trials. Next slide, please. The largest trial of uh, convalescent plasma was recently reported again by the by Joyner and the uh, group with Casa Deval. <clears throat> and there was a very large number of subjects who received plasma and it was uh, an observational study, but dissected both by the investigators and by the FDA to come to the conclusion that the benefit might outweigh the risk. Now, this um, has led to a lot of controversy. Next slide, please. So 
investigators, other, uh, I would say, uh, authorities, governmental and other authorities, were concerned that the observational data available was not sufficient to lead to emergency youth author authorization. It, it, there was already emergency authorization, but that requires obviously more paperwork than EUA. So on, I guess, the 19th, it was concluded this this would not be approved based on the available data. Next, and then, of course, by the 22nd, the federal government had changed their mind, which uh, I think has only perhaps created conf more confusion. Next slide, please. So here's kind of a summary of my thinking about this. Convalescent plasma, uh, the potential benefits I think everyone on the call would recognize. It, it may be difficult to obtain, and of course it's going to be increasingly difficult to obtain if we do a good job in controlling the epidemic. We don't know what's in convalescent plasma. My friend Michelle Neusenzweig um, very carefully looked at, at so, uh, a couple of 150 plasma samples, arguing that the um, diversity in what's in plasma and the ability to predict how much neutralizing antibody was in plasma was difficult. Um, the other problem with convalescent plasma, especially provided late in infection, is it's hard to know that the causality is in the neutralizing antibodies. There may be other things in convalescent plasma that actually uh, leads to a benefit. We don't know how much titer is required to prevent um, uh, to benefit or to prevent ongoing infection or to prevent infection. Uh, and there's been a belief that one in 640 may be an attractive titer, but that's rather arbitrary. You know that there's no large randomized trial. And I think that the concern that is ongoing and that you'll see that has been published already and will be published more is the concern that if we provide the general population with something that's not randomized, but that they can get, where, where the results are not entirely secure, but they can get without randomization, it might compromise randomized controlled trials of therapeutics, whether they're monoclonals or antivirals, <clears throat> because the the uh, person in the hospital, the pot potential participant or the outpatient with COVID may gravitate to a non-randomized agent, even if they're not 100% sure how well it works. So this is where we are. Convalescent plasma has EUA approval. None of the organized bodies have yet made it a standard of care. And so we're going to have to see where this goes. Next slide, please. But I think it, it's safe to say that the belief system is that if convalescent plasma would work either for prevention or for treatment, that what would be in it would be a neutralizing antibody. So let's kind of move to the more modern era and can we pivot to monoclonal antibodies? Next slide, please. So I think this exceptionally um, well done paper uh, by Dennis, Dennis Burden's group deserves just a, a couple of minutes of attention. Next slide, please. In, the, in this paper, Dennis, I think, did a very nice job of, of showing kind of the modern technology that we're, and, and this will be, this has been true for COVID, and it's also going to be true as we encounter uh, new pathogens attacking the species, especially viral pathogens. It's possible to harvest blood, isolate B cells, identify uh, antibodies that are particularly effective, isolate B cells capable of making those antibodies in very short order, develop neutralization assays, uh, see if the if the if the virus if the if the monoclonal can be made in reasonable titers, and then test it in animal models. In Dennis's case, he tested it in in, in Syrian hamsters. Um, the, the models that we're seeing used to, to as a, a presage uh, to clinical trials are, of course in vitro neutralization, either with wild type virus or pseudotype virus, mice of different types, um, including humanized mice, Syrian hamsters, and macaques. Next slide, please. What's most interesting, I think, in, in, in Dennis's paper is for the Syrian hamster and mice, weight loss is a, is a big metric, but you can also look in, as in the red circle, you can also look at uh, at um, the effect of the antibodies that they generated on viral titers um, as, a as a function of concentration of antibody. And if you look at the far left, you see that, that you get a, a copious amount of um, uh, recovery of virus from the animal. But if, as you give uh, reasonable concentrations of the antibody, you can prevent replication of the virus. It's very compelling that they isolated an antibody with good potency and the potential to uh, serve a clinical purpose. Next slide, please. 
So it kind of brings us to a discussion for which I'm going to slow down because I believe everybody knew everything I've already said. I'm going to slow down and talk about how we're thinking about the use of monoclonals for prevention. And, and the obvious thing is that they're, they're bookends to a vaccine. They're not competing with vaccines. That They offer immediate protection, depending on how they're delivered, whether uh, IV or IM or sub-Q. They offer very immediate protection. They'd be particularly attractive for people who could not take a vaccine. Um, they may be um, appropriate for populations who can't respond to a vaccine. Um, they can work both as potentially as prevention and treatment. Um, and lastly, of course, they can serve as a surrogate for what kinds of concentration of antibody would be required for a vaccine to be successful. And so that surrogate role is very important in, in, in these kinds of studies. So if, if you're looking for populations who would benefit from a monoclonal, it can't be everyone like a vaccine. It's got to be the ones I've already indicated. So we're particularly interested in, in skilled nursing homes or uh, places where older uh, people are working, and we're also interested in the attendants in these facilities for a variety of reasons who have proven themselves to be at high risk um, for infection. Um, there are workplaces that have proven to also, and communities that have high risk, and that is the so-called meatpacking protein industry. And then there are households where the attack rate is anywhere from 10 to 30 um, percent, depending on how the household is organized. So we're looking for risk and environment that justify application of monoclonals as, and first we're going to focus on prevention. Next slide, please. So there are lots of monoclonals. This is not an exhaustive list of monoclonals, but the, the companies that are have, where the train is leaving the station are Lilly, Regeneron, Veer, AstraZeneca, and likely BMS and the Rockefeller. Um, I'll talk about the Lilly and Regeneron trials in a little bit more detail. Um, as I said, Veer and AstraZeneca are also planning on leaving the train station soon. Uh, next, and shown on this slide, which is available to you, are the antibodies that they have, and it kind of brings up the first debate. And the first debate is, is one antibody sufficient? The advantage being you're giving one antibody in terms of toxicity and in terms of cost and uh, degree of difficulty, but it has been argued, and it must be true, that one antibody may select resistant variants. You can certainly do this in a test tube. Regeneron, who uh, are using a cocktail of two antibodies, um, have argued that they can generate resistance in, in uh, vitro uh, in a science paper. So this, this one versus two argument um, is going to play out. Um, I would say that Lilly and Veer right now are committed to exploring one antibody, but of course both companies could make cocktails of antibodies. Uh, another issue that I'm not going to discuss in great detail, but probably is worth talking about on this slide, is the modification of the FC portion. Um, if you modify FC, you can get a longer half-life drug. Um, AstraZeneca has a YTE modification that gives them a much longer half-life. I think Veer has an LS mutation that gives them a much longer half-life. And of course, um, depending on what you're using the drug for, that long half-life could be very attractive. Next slide, please. So let's just talk, so regenerate now, this brings us to kind of the collaboration of the 20th century. And I'll just be very brief of explaining it, 21st century, sorry. Um, Operation Warp Speed has different arms. Uh, one of its arms, of course, embraces the NIH and the Vaccine Research Center. In that universe, there's the COVID Prevention Network, which I'm one, not the PI of, just one of the, have the opportunity to be one of the leaders of uh, Kathy News and Larry Corey, who spoke to you earlier, are the PIs of that network. <clears throat> um, David Stevens and I, as leaders, are held responsible for monoclonals. Um, in the context of this network, there's a lot, <clears throat> the way it's working with respect to collaborations on vaccines and on monoclonals, are <clears throat> the company remains the sponsor. The company remains a sponsor. We try and use our investigators and our sites in collaboration. So the first collaboration I'd like to mention is one with Regeneron, where they've gone through phase one testing. They're doing their own studies for therapeutics, but we're participating in, in trying to develop their drug as a preventive agent by looking at households. And the numbers, of this, for us, this is COVID Prevention Network Study 2069. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, this is 
the coronavirus spike protein you're all familiar with. Next slide, please. This is Regeneron's antibodies and how they're affecting the spike re receptor binding domain. Um, these are the antibodies they've selected using the platform they use to develop antibodies, which is called Velocimmune. Um, next slide, please. All the antibodies, whether a single antibody or a um, combination of antibodies, are examined for their potency. And this is just a, a curve showing the neutralization potency using VeroE6 cells with the uh, single agents and the combination of agents, arguing that, that, the, that the concentrations they can achieve in animals and in humans should be sufficient to neutralize um, SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. So this complicated slide, and I'm going to slow down here a little bit. So what's going on with this trial? It's a one-to-one -one randomization of, of um, people exposed through household contact. So it is estimated that if you enrolled 2,000 asymptomatic household contacts where the index case who's tested positive within the last four days is living in the household, that the attack rate would be sufficient with risk to the people living in the household, that if you randomize to the monoclonal cocktail compared to a placebo, you could demonstrate prevention of infection. Now, one big advantage in the monoclonal studies compared to the vaccine studies are is that you can do much more frequent sampling of saliva and the nares in order to understand um, not just whether you would be preventing progression of disease in those who acquire infection, but are you actually uh, creating either sterilizing immunity or preventing infection itself? Now, it must be obvious that if, if you're in a household at zero time and the only exclusion criteria, real exclusion criteria, is symptomatic infection or known past infection, that you're actually enrolling two cohorts. Cohort A, it, 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 cohort A is someone exposed and either you're giving pre-exposure prophylaxis or post-exposure prophylaxis. And cohort B are actually people who are asymptomatically infection, infected. It's kind of bleeding into, the, into that cohort B. So you're doing a treatment trial for early infection as well as a prevention trial concomitantly. With 2,000 subjects, we estimate that about three to 400 will have asymptomatic infection, and that would be powered to tell us whether we were um, positively affecting viral replication or inhibiting viral replication in, in cohort B. Cohort A would demonstrate that the Regeneron cocktail has prevented infection in that cohort. Um, because the exposure is over a short period of time, it's a single dose of an antibody with then subsequent follow-up for safety. This study is enrolled, has got a, almost 100 sites around the United States. Some are NIH sites, some are uh, sites that are directed by Regeneron. Uh, it's a very robust partnership that's gone well, and um, a substantial number of people have been enrolled, and we're optimistic that if we can enroll quickly, we could have an answer by the mid-fall. Um, we may also uh, now move to some of our sites in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South America. We have many sites around the world. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the hardest hit population of the United States with no doubt are nursing homes, where, as indicated in this article, there's an unprecedented attempt to use structural interventions to stop the ongoing transmission of COVID among uh, people living in nursing homes and the attendants. Next slide, please. About 35% of all deaths from COVID are people living in skilled nursing facilities and even a much larger number of people in that age group. Next, next slide, please. Nursing homes are distributed all around the United States. There's more than a million people living in skilled nursing facilities around the United States. They're not all the same. They have tremendous diversity. Next slide, please. So we're doing a study with Lily, who's been a terrific uh, collaborator called Blaze2. And, and I must say, I saw this reported in the press. There's nothing more heartbreaking. We started out in the spring um, talking to CEOs of nursing homes who were having 
tremendous death among the people living there as well as some of their staff. And uh, it's really heartbreaking. So Lily um, really right away got on board and said, we'd like to help and um, developed a, a uh, study or with us developed a study um, to try and determine the benefits of, of uh, their monoclonal antibody, single monoclonal in this case, in a skilled nursing facilities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is their antibody, um, LY3819253. They have some confidence that a single antibody is sufficient. Next slide. Here in the study we're doing, it's a one-to-one -one randomization, placebo versus the antibody. Um, and again, we have a cohort A and a cohort B. Cohort A is for prevention. Now again, we have the advantage of being able to look at uh, uh, replication inhibition and prevention of infection among exposed participants and staff. This trial is for the attendants or healthcare workers and for uh, those living in the facility. Um, so we have the advantage of, of looking at two metrics. One would be if disease occurs, is it, does it prevent progression of disease, as is the routine vaccine metric. Another is, can we actually prevent infection? Um, and so we have a lot going on in virology, um, in our virology space, to try and prove this possibility. Uh, we also have a cohort B, of course, those who are already infected but are asymptomatic, um, just as I described in our Regeneron study. Next slide, please. Now, what Lily has done that's quite remarkable is as they got into this, they said, you know, kind of in for a dime, in for a dollar, and they stood up SWAT teams that could go to nursing homes under attack. And because none of us know how to work in skilled nursing facilities, there's very little uh, randomized, there are very few therapeutic randomized clinical trials of the size we need, two, 3,000 people. So Lily put together teams that could go on short order to a facility and stay a week and enroll as many people as would want to be enrolled to their product and then subsequently leave one person behind uh, for the follow-up. And uh, they've already um, enrolled a substantial number of subjects in several facilities uh, through their the, the vans and the personnel that they've recruited. Um, the network is helping to provide investigators in these different uh, places that help work with the vans and the physicians and healthcare workers in the facilities to make this a, a, um, a, a logistical, logistically satisfying experience. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, there are lots of monoclonal antibodies they have the potential for prevention either short term like Lily and Regeneron, which have no FC mutation, or longer term like AstraZeneca or, or Veer. They um, could be a single antibody or a cocktail of antibodies. Um, and we are anxious to see how well they work um, in the prevention space. But of course, antibody, monoclonal antibodies in the absence of a, of a substantially beneficial antiviral agent um, or additional antiviral agents beyond remdesivir, um, they can also be used for treatment. So this brings us to Operation Warp Speed and the active platforms. Operation Warp Speed, um, I think everyone's familiar with already, and there's four active platforms. Active one is to test anti-inflammatory agents. That's being run by NCATS at the NIH and uh, clinical research organizations. Active two is for outpatient Treatment that's being run by the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, which is really part of the COVID Prevention Network collaboration. Um, active three is for inpatient treatments that's being run by the Insight Network. Active four is for anticoagulation intervention that's being run by Heart, Lung, and Blood and their Connect Network. Now, active two and three are kind of just leaving the gate, and they're really very focused on monoclonal antibodies. And next slide, please. They active two I'll focus on, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm more involved with. They have an adaptive platform so they could concomitantly compare different agents. Um, and their first study is, uh, let's look at the next slide, please. It shows the platform. So it's a randomized blind and controlled platform where you begin in a phase two, you demonstrate some signals that are beneficial and you move to a phase three. So active two has embraced Lily's antibody, 
That's the first antibody out of the gate. Uh, a few people have already been in, in, enrolled in active two. Active three, the inpatient monoclonal has also embraced Lilly's antibody. And so they'll be using it for people who are uh, sicker and hospitalized. These active uh, studies with Lilly's monoclonal are in their first phase. Other agents are in the pipeline beyond um, Lilly's monoclonal, both um, potentially some small molecules that would have antiviral activity, uh, um, or and or other monoclonals. Next slide, please. So ending right on time, because time is short, this is the summary. Our current technology is quite amazing and it leads to really facile generation of monoclonal antibodies. Animal models, mice, hamsters, and macaques have great utility, uh, I believe. Monoclonals are attractive agents for very emergent COVID prevention um, as they're being used. They're bookends to vaccines, as I've said. They can also be used therapeutically to inhibit COVID replication. Treatment and prevention trials have left the train station. They're underway. The trials can be much smaller. The vaccine trials, is, as you all know, are 30,000 per trial. The trials of the monoclonals are two to 5,000 per trial, most around 2,000. So that if we can enroll them, we can get an answer very fast. So we're working very hard on gaining the trust of the communities that we need to work with us and enrolling as fast as we can, because we really think these can be an unbelievably <coughs> positive contribution. Next slide, please. Let me just acknowledge that like this talk I've just given is really you know, work of many, many people. I wanna thank NIID, the entire COVID prevention network, Eli Lilly, Regeneron, chairs of, of the Regeneron study, uh, chairs of the Lilly study, and, and all these slides were liberated from other people. So I've, I've stolen slides from too many people to even thank them all. Um, but I wanna thank everyone whose slide I just used. And I'm glad to answer any questions if time permits. So thanks for inviting me and I'll stop talking. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Cohen. That was wonderful. As we all know, vaccine traditionally divide as uh, uh, active immunization versus the passive immunization with the modern technology. The passive immunization become incredible powerful. Uh, given the time limit, I will ask uh, two related questions. First, on the side of prevention, if the any of this trial showing a greater result, how do you select what population and who should get the prevention? Because traditionally, uh, tr the prevention treatment usually give as an exposure, but how do you give if a larger population? Yeah, I think I think if, if, if the trial proves successful, we will almost certainly um, make the agents available to people to older people living in skilled nursing facilities as the highest priority, uh, both because of the trial design themselves and because of the probability of progression of disease. The next population would be people living in households, but who have uh, morbidities that would suggest progression of disease. So I think, um, as you know, the National Academy of Science, the Institute of Medicine, uh, National Academy of Medicine, Institute of Medicine has a committee that's in, in, uh, considering vaccine priority. We have a beginnings of a similar committee considering um, uh, monoclonal antibody priority, both for prevention, for prevention in particular, both in the United States and outside the United States. That that idea is just forming uh, at this point in time. Yes, I think uh, that monoclonal antibody going to be very important given many other issues with the new vaccine technology. So the next one relate is therapy. Uh, we have learned the population of infected people at the what stage of disease is very important. Many trials try to go to hospital, severe patient, uh, ICU patient. Uh, most drugs turned out not useful. So the argument was the most treatment for severe cases may be the wrong population to do trial because the early time you can treat too late, no matter antibody or small molecule drug might be too late. What do you think about yeah, that? I feel even more aggressively about that than the way you've just said it. I think that um, the agents that we have, the monoclonals and other antiviral agents, we need to prove that they can serve as an antiviral very early in infection. The, the, the way these many of the trials have been done, do not seem to take into consideration molecular virology 
and biology as well as we'd like them to. I know that, and I know the degree of difficulty of the trials, but we would like to sample prospectively kind of on a daily basis and look at subgenomic RNA and, and a variety of other ways of measuring we're getting an antiviral effect. This is important for a couple of reasons, because if we can abrogate progression of disease, we can change the way our society is living right now. And the other point that I've worked on for a very long time is the treatment as prevention idea. We, I work at a university that's got a very large number of students infected right now. And if we had an agent that we could give them that would stop uh, replication competent virus and prevent the next person from getting infected, it would be very beneficial to us. So I personally think that these agents, that the agents we're developing, including monoclonals, are most desirable for very, very early infection, very early infection. Yes, thank you. I, I think the audience asks a lot of good questions. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, ask all of them. We have to move on. Again, we'd like to thank Professor Cohen for a very great overview. And uh, we are looking forward for another powerful tool uh, to control this uh, horrible pandemic. Thank you. We hope thank we have you. a chance to invite you back again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So next one, it's my great honor to introduce the second keynote speaker, Dr. Linda Stewart from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, Dr. Stewart is the leader of vaccine discovery and human immunology at the Bill Gates Foundation, uh, oversight of a broad portfolio of vaccines, biologics, and the core rate of protection study across the foundation. Uh, Linda uh, is a trained physician scientist she was an MD from the University of Cambridge and University of London, and also PhD from University of Edinburgh. Uh, he, uh, she did conduct a very extensive basic immunology, especially in the area of innate immune response research. She was on the faculty of Harvard Medical School, uh, Broad Institute, MIT, before uh, joining uh, Gates Foundation. Uh, we are very uh, honored to have her here to tell us how we can win the race to billions of doses. Linda, thank you. Oh, please mute, unmute. Yeah, good. Good morning. Um, I'm not sure if people can hear me just now. Uh, yeah, good very morning. well. Thank you very much for the invitation to uh, speak, Joanne, and the um, uh, organizing committee. Um, as um, introduced, I'm Linda Sturt. I lead um, the vaccine discovery at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in peacetime. And in, at this point, I'm also one of the co-leads of the vaccine response team. And I'm presenting really on behalf of that larger team. So next slide, please. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is really how we can win this um, um, race to a billion doses. But before I do that, I thought I would introduce very quickly the foundation's uh, response to uh, COVID-19, which focused on four main goals. Uh, starting in January, we really set out to protect the most vulnerable um, by strengthening capacity and coordination in key uh, low and middle income countries to uh, accelerate the detection and containment of virus by filling gaps and enabling global response partners. Um, we launched a um, um, work to minimize the societal and economic impact and also to finally to develop treatments and a vaccine. So next slide. So the R&D program really focused on these three areas. First of all, um, developing um, cheap and deployable diagnostics and tests. Secondly, to identify new therapies, including uh, monoclonal antibody therapies, um, such as those that Mike has just described. And then thirdly, to uh, enable the, team, the field by identifying, developing, and then ultimately deploying a COVID-19 vaccine, which we think will be the ultimately um, tool required to end this global pandemic. So next slide, please. So at the Gates Foundation, uh, vaccines really are a priority and the foundation is very heavily invested in vaccines as public health tools because we recognize that these are the tools with the greatest impact. 
And for the past 20 years, the foundation has really spent billions of dollars on developing and then ultimately enabling the delivery of vaccines to protect children in low and middle income countries. In the upstream R&D space, um, Discovery, a team at the foundation, we spend about $50 million on tools needed for discovery and translation of new vaccines and monoclonal antibody therapies for all global health indications. And this was in addition to the work, um, the, the investments we make in our disease specific areas, we really put a lot of money into in, uh, uh, in invest in a disease agnostic way and have built a comprehensive toolkit of vaccines for vaccines and antibody R&D. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We build enabling frameworks that can support vaccines for any and all foundation priority diseases. We prioritize in this effort really the cross cutting platforms and approaches over disease specific solutions and we bet on novel technologies and innovative solutions and we're very comfortable working on programs that have extremely long pipe um, timelines such as messenger RNA vaccines and our first investment in this area as an example was made in 2014 when we took a uh, made an equity investment in the company CureVac. So next slide, please. So this um, investment really means that we are able to, or we have built a really extensive toolkit for vaccine R&D. So um, this really includes efforts that uh, support subunit and protein vaccines, nucleic acid vaccines, including both mRNA and DNA, live um, attenuated viral vectors, uh, monoclonal antibody and other um, biologic therapies and vaccine correlates of protection. And this is all underpinned by something called Global Health Vaccine Accelerator platforms, which are a set of uh, enabling tools um, and that are, support both um, these efforts and also the basic science um, of uh, vaccine discovery. Next slide, please. So this existing um, set of investments really enabled the foundation to have a very rapid COVID-19 vaccine response. We recognize that CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic and Preparedness and Innovation, which have been a very key partner and player in this space, their early response was very much focused on speed. And the foundation launched a, actually a, um, um, began supporting a, a, a set of um, vaccine programs um, really very early on in the COVID response to enable the field with the goal of enabling the field in general and partners such as CEPI very specifically to develop a portfolio of wave two vaccine candidates that were focused um, and differentiated from the wave one by affordability and scalability so that may be suitable for low and moderate income countries and global pandemic response and also to enable the development and deployment ultimately of billions of doses. And that is what is required really to protect everybody on the planet. So we really uh, thought about this in, in six different areas um, and um, focused first on understanding the basics of this virus itself. We leveraged our existing vaccine platforms and our existing networks to invade, um, to build an enabling framework. We prioritized vaccines that could be made at billions of doses. And we've now in the process of trying to accelerate development and already planning to distribute vaccines through our existing networks in um, low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. So the, normally, um, if you want thinks about vaccine R&D, it really is normally a 15 year process and it really is uh, laid out like this, where the, each of these things happen in series, phase one, two, three. And then we basically don't start manufacturing until um, thing, we know things are working, such as in phase three. So what we have tried to do in COVID-19 is to shorten this timeline very significantly from 15 years to one or two. So next slide. And what that really has meant is that we're doing a lot of things at risk and a lot of things in parallel with the hope that we will have both a licensed vaccine within uh, the first year to 18 months and also then be able to deploy this within the first the next year or two. So what are we doing differently and how have things changed? So next slide. So I'm going to focus initially on what are we doing differently in discovery and preclinical development. This phase of vaccine development can often take between one and five years and for things like HIV is still ongoing. 
Um, and really what we've done differently for COVID-19 is to leverage a lot of novel platforms such as mRNA. And we're also pulling, the globe is pulling together a much larger portfolio of candidates in parallel rather than waiting for one to fail. And there are a number of important players in this. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining how we have taken this normally five year process down to less than five months. And so um, that's what I'm going to focus on next. Next slide, please. So the first thing we did was to really um, enable the field and to help understand some of the basics and focus very much on the structural biology of SARS-CoV-2 and the virus. So most coronavirus vaccines really focus on the spike protein. And many of the, um, and what was identified in 2017 was a really important um, molecular tool that was uh, developed by Jason McClellan working in Barney Graham's group that would allowed a, um, the, by through the introduction of two prolines um, mutations to stabilize the spike of MERS and SARS-1. SARS when the novel coronavirus was released in January 10th, by, um, you know, if this is remarkable, the speed that we then real, um, the, uh, the crystal structure was solved by February 15th, and it became apparent that that same two protein mutation was in fact able to stabilize the SARS-CoV-2 spike. We very rapidly, the field has gone on to understand a lot about the biology of the virus, how it binds, what the entry receptors and co-receptors are. And I think a couple of important basic science findings have been the identification of the D6, D614 uh, variant, which is really the dominant global variant, which is believed to be potentially uh, more uh, infectious. But also this information has also allowed for new improved immunogens to be generated, such as um, a, a recent um, set of mutations called Hexapro that were described by Jason McCullen's group uh, um, um, that uh, improve the stability and productivity and yield of that protein. Next slide, please. The other important basic work has really been, as Mike has alluded to, the, the identification of, of monoclonal antibodies and understanding how they protect. So all of the vaccines um, essentially aim to drive uh, neutralizing antibodies. And these antibodies have been really useful or, uh, or can be used to identify sites of vulnerability on the virus and the viral sp spike. And to protective and um, protective antibodies were very rapidly identified um, from and isolated from patients. Antibody mediated protection was um, shown um, as soon as early as May um, in animal models and from the groups shown here. I think one of the key things that's happened in all this has been the rapid release of data through uh, bioarchive. Um, but these antibodies were um, identified um, and demonstrated to work in monoclonal anti uh, in animal models. And then by June, the new antibodies were really coming online. And as Mike alluded to, the first antibodies entered the clinic, the Lilly antibody entered the clinic by June 1st. And that is an amazing um, sort of shortening of the normal timelines for antibody therapies. Um, and I think it's been really um, unprecedented. Um, uh, so next slide, please. The second thing we, we really as a foundation really focused on was use of um, vaccine platforms rather than sort of boutique um, approaches. So one of the key platforms that uh, we, um, we had invested in were messenger RNA. So in, I'm sure everybody knows this, but you know, these are important because you introduce the mRNA into the body and the body's own machinery makes the vaccine. Um, we have been in this space since 2014 uh, through our, our investments in CureVac, but we also work closely with all of the mRNA and DNA companies. Um, we These are rapid response, versatile, and really are potentially very disruptive technology, and I think we're seeing their potential disruptiveness um, as we speak. The, the real uh, drawback is that these have not yet been in licensed products. We don't know the dose and we don't really know where they can be um, made at scale. That said, multiple mRNA vaccines are in the clinic and two have entered phase three studies by the end of July. So both uh, Moderna and BioNTech are in phase three. And this is really a, um, you know, to get into the 
um, phase three within six months again, uh, unprecedented. Next slide. The second, the, the next platform I'm going to discuss is, is just um, is um, a nanoparticle display. So there are a number of these. This is just one example of this from the Institute of Protein Design. So the viral spike protein is, um, we know, is sufficient to induce a protective response. Um, but that such synthetically designed nanoparticles or viral light particles or other um, um, multimeric displays can allow well-controlled display of complex proteins such as spike trimers. Um, they improve the immune response to these proteins and they can be dose sparing. So there are um, so the Novavax vaccine, as an example, is a is a um, particle display. This is a, a computationally designed one shown on the right from the Institute of Protein Design. But we think this sort of dose sparing capability may be extremely important as we're really looking at that billion dose scale. So if any such subunit requires adjuvants and to boost the immune response, and one of the things the foundation has done is really strive to um, provide access to commercially available adjuvants and also to bring new adjuvants online as adjuvant capacity may be limiting. Next slide. Okay, the, the third thing we really focused on was building enabling tools and enabling frameworks such as animal models. Um, we know all vaccines are ultimately tested in animals to show immunogenicity, um, but as far as efficacy, we know that the mouse um, ACE2 receptor is not um, really supportive of the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, infection. Um, small animal models therefore have relied on transgenic um, mice that express the human ACE2 receptors or the serendipitous finding that the Syrian golden hamster has an ACE2 receptor that is closely homologous to humans. And this has actually been a really important and useful tool for um, uh, um, um, the uh, um, testing therapies and vaccines. And ultimately, these are um, um, these are um, uh, used and need to be tested in um, uh, non-human primates to show safety and efficacy. So next slide. The other enabling tool um, set that we've really um, strived to build at the foundation is, uh, is uh, assays, reagents, and for correlates of protection. So we've Really robust immune assays are absolutely essential to uh, um, enable a portfolio approach and portfolio management of a large number of vaccines. These sorts of assays are required to support regulatory filing and qualified and validated assays are needed for the clinic. And um, these assays are also being useful for evaluating antibody therapies um, and we're uh, um, and um, other tools for protein characterization and so forth. I think a major gap that remains in the field really is around correlates of protection and there really is a, a sort of I think a, a work to be done from to identify correlates from the early vaccines that would enable the fast followers in the portfolio and really enable those sort of global um, the, the number of doses um, that we will require to get to global supply. So next slide, please. The other, the final thing that we've done in the discovery space is really to, to prioritize vaccines that we believe could be made at billions of doses and really think very early about manufacturing. Um, so we do think that two to four billion doses will ultimately needed, needed to be produced to protect the, the globe. Um, we really, um, the foundation has really focused a lot of our vaccine uh, uh, subunit efforts on rapid protein production systems that have really high yields, such as Picia pastoris, which is uh, can, proteins can be made in massive fermenters. Uh, we've been collaborating very closely with many of the developing country manufacturers that have a lot of extant capacity, from fermentation capacity, and where we'd be able to scale with minimal capex. And we really actually went um, started by designing vaccines specifically that could be manufactured on these um, part platforms or by these DCVM partners to be able to get to those billions of doses that we think we might need. So next slide. 
So I've talked to you a little bit about how to shorten this one to five year discovery and preclinical. And in the last three or four minutes, I'm going to quickly take you through what we've done in the rest of this time to accelerate the rest of this timeline. So next slide. So the phase one studies, what are we doing differently here? Um, these um, are small safety studies. Normally these are conducted in preclinical models in parallel um, um, in series, but here we're doing the preclinical testing and human testing pretty much in parallel um, to identify dose and safety. Uh, next slide. The next phase of vaccine development is phase two and then phase three. Again, normally these are done in series. What's happening in this in the COVID vaccine space now really is a blended phase two, three, um, once safety has been demonstrated in phase one. And then there's also this possibility for portfolio acceleration through correlates of protection if we could get there. One of the real problems with the phase two, three studies is they're complicated, particularly because the epidemiology of COVID-19 is very unpredictable. And so these efficacy studies are really hard to run, require multiple sites, very complex. And I think really important uh, work is the platforms that have been set up by the NIH Operation Warp Speed. And also there is a platform study that is under design by the WHO for, called the Solidarity 3 protocol. Next slide, please. Once a vaccine has gone through these um, phase three studies, we then have to go on to registration and licensure. So we do anticipate that there will be an accelerated or emergency use um, uh, for any vaccine that has been shown to be efficacious and then uh, full registration and WHO pre-qualification will follow. The regulatory agencies are acting with a lot of urgency, but we don't anticipate any um, uh, shortening of or uh, around safety um, because really this is the most important thing. So all of the, the evidence suggests that uh, both FDA and EMA will approve them through stringent, um, uh, the normal stringent um, criteria. Next slide. The other thing that we are doing is really manufacturing at risk. And so typically um, manufacturing scale up is the most significant delay for where vaccines development occurs. It really doesn't normally start until a vaccine has been shown to work. But this is somewhere where we're looking at this huge capacity it will require massive manufacturing capacity and we are funding um, the, 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 found, the, the globe, not the foundation, but the globe in general is really funding manufacturing capacity at risk. They're retrofitting existing capacity rather than building new sites because it's faster. And this is really where this massive investment is going to be required and will require large global cooperation. And finally, once we do get to that 4 billion doses, next slide. Um, once we do get to that 4 billion doses, how are we going to get those doses to um, people who need them? And the, the global architecture for support of um, the tools, the COVID-19 tools through the ACT Accelerator um, will focus on delivering um, both vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. And the COVAX pillar of the ACT Accelerator, which is co-convened by CEPI and then in working on R&D and Gavi working on uh, procurement and deployment, really seeks to begin already to start thinking about how they're going to purchase and how can they're going to get these vaccines into the field. Um, so maybe click through the next slide and I'll just end there to say, as you can see, this is an enormously complicated process. And for us really to get to that billion, those billions of doses will take coordinate coordination across R&D, manufacturing, procurement and deployment and to protect all of the, um, the planet. So with that uh, next slide, I'd like to just uh, stop and thank everybody for uh, um, listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Stewart, for a wonderful overview of Gates Foundation's programs. Uh, I may have only time for ask one question. So. Uh, since in this complicated process, there are many organizations involved. So what's the exact role of Gates Foundation providing funding? I know there's a lot of technical things, but uh, for example, how do you coordinate with the CEPI or US government? Uh, how do you coordinate you know, this complicated system here? 
Yeah, so the foundation is primarily a funding body um, and we, um, but we work very closely. We have a lot of internal technical expertise um, and actually our technical teams are really expert um, vaccine R&D. A lot of people from industry with a lot of deep technical expertise. We work closely and um, both through um, that technical know-how and also funding know um, with partners such as CEPI. We coordinate closely with the US government and the NIH um, and um, governments all over the world um, to um, both advise and fund the critical parts of the, the this process. And we fund through both grants, but also we're able to um, fund through program related investments, um, uh, loans and um, a lot of that sort of funding is actually being really important in uh, enabling pre-purchasing of vaccine doses or um, or uh, helping manufacturers have the, the the money on hand to expand their manufacturing capacity. So we have because we have a lot of different approaches to funding, we actually can enable everywhere along that whole R and D continuum. Thank you. Uh, I think Gates Foundation is in a unique position, a very critical, very important. Uh, thank you. And uh, we will put your talk at the YouTube. This is a very rich, a lot of detailed information. I'm sure people will enjoy uh, learning that uh, contribution from the foundation. Thank you, Linda. I know you're busy. Take the time to be here very early in the morning in Seattle. Thank you very much. Uh, so great.